So some of you know this, I grew up nearby in Valdosta, Georgia. And uh, when I was growing up in Valdosta, my brother and I had a dog named Kiss It. And Kiss It was named Kiss It because we had this crazy cousin who looked at the puppy and said, that dog is so cute, I think I'm going to kiss it. And uh, that cousin is now incarcerated in Little Rock, Arkansas for stealing a horse, <laughs> which you'll all be glad to know is still a, a crime in Arkansas, at least. So um, uh, it was a bad name for the dog because the dog was a little of this and a little of that and none too pretty. It was just the ugliest dog. And that dog did two things well. That dog slept and that dog hunted. And uh, m about 85% of the time it spent sleeping. But uh, in one particular two-week period in the early summer in 1976, between baseball season and this trip that my dad made me go on up to Washington, D.C. to enjoy this country's wonderful bicentennial celebration, I watched that dog's haul, which was at least four squirrels, two baby possums, a bird that was mostly dead already, and a really big female mallard duck and that duck was taken in a most spectacular fashion in the shallows of the lake. And I tell you this story because I, um, it was my first, my first lesson in, in work and leisure. It was, it was when I first realized that uh, work and the rewards from work don't uh, necessarily match up. It's not a cause and effect relationship as most would have us think. And so I became an idler. And so I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about work and idling. But I want to start with the basics. I want to start with what is work. And in 1976, again, in Ms. Boswell's class, um, I learned what we probably all learned, uh, the definition of work. Does anybody remember it? Uh, it's, uh, it's when you adjust uh, the position of matter at or near the Earth's surface in relation to other such matter. Sound familiar? <laughs> so um, if I take a pear, is this a pear? Yeah. And I move it from here over to here, I have accomplished work. Thank you. <laughs> if I convince you to move this pear for me, that's work too. That's management work. <laughs> if, if I... Uh, talk to you about how best to move that pair. That's work too. That's consulting. <laughs> if uh, another consultant comes along and teaches you a better way to move that pair than my pair, well, then we have a real problem. We've gotten into politics and we need another form of work. Uh, we need advertising work so that we can prove to you that our way of moving that pair is best. So uh, we all work um, in some way or another with that pair. And um, I think we would all agree that work is necessary. Uh, we must sustain ourselves, and, and so we must work. Um, the, uh, and throughout our collective history, I think we'd all also agree that we've had to work pretty hard. Um, it used to be that uh, the men would have to go out and hunt, and the women would mend the huts, and the kids would pick the berries and milk the cows or whatever. I mean, we've all read all the history books, and it sounds like it was a pretty tough existence, kind of getting up early, working all day before you went to bed, well, except for festival days, or uh, there was a, a rainy day, or a wedding, uh, maybe a public hanging, or pretty much any day in the winter. But for the most part, we worked really hard. Um, then came the Industrial Revolution, uh, and then the digital revolution, and so we effectively, we, we exponentially uh, increased our ability to, to complete work efficiently. We, uh, we did kind of the impossible. We sort of solved that whole Adam's curse thing. We invented idleness. Uh, for the first time, we had the option to just, to just sit, to sit and do nothing or to think um, we could apprentice and learn a new skill. You know, maybe we could play lute in our buddy's band or something. Um, we could surf the internet. Uh, we could just become more than we were. Um, but something happened. Um, 
But before I get into the vast conspiracy theories, um, I'd like to do a mental exercise um, that will also give the snipers a little time to take me out, un unless they're tired of working too. Um, <laughs> sorry. Work, uh, the UN says work actually kills more than two million people a year, so think about that. Um, so the mental exercise. Take your working week and take your idle weekend and reverse them. What if you could work two days a week and take the rest of the week off? And I'd like to, I wish I could give you five or six minutes to think about that, but I'm, I'm on the clock. Um, what would you do? People would say, well, what do you do for a living? And you'd say, well, who gives a crap? I only have to do it two days a week. <laughs> um, you know, what would you do? Um, well, you'd probably get drunk a lot. You'd probably surf porn. You'd probably go to late night dance parties. But you'd live, right? You'd do all the things that you like to do. You'd learn to be idle. You'd think. Well, the powers that be couldn't really have all that going on with everybody. And so here, in a nutshell, is what happened. And I'll keep this brief because I really don't want to get shot. Um, instead of, uh, when, when, we, when we increased our effectiveness at work, when we doubled the amount of work we could produce, instead of letting everybody leave at noon, they just fired half the people. And they kind of set up this system. Uh, they started some advertising campaigns. Thomas Carlyle, I think, said, uh, you know, uh, every idle moment is treason. And they, they chucked one of the seven deadly sins and replaced it with sloth. Um, it, it really was a concerted effort to make us all feel pretty bad if we weren't working, even though we really couldn't all work because everything was much more efficient. But all of that wasn't really enough to quell our advances. We had done too good a job at getting better at work, and so they had to do something else. They had to raise consumption. They had to uh, raise what we considered uh, to be what our sustenance, what we needed to live. And so they brought it back into balance uh, to try to get rid of the idleness. Now, you know, I have been called paranoid, I've been called a communist, I've been called a heretic, I've been called a paranoid communist heretic. <laughs> I can assure you that I'm far too lazy to be any of these things. Um, I'm more of an insinuator than a revolutionary, as most idlers are. Um, so I'm going to step back from the controversial target uh, topics, and I'm just going to give you three tips that will help you become a better lazy person. And you can accomplish these things right here without really moving. And my first tip is what I call adopting the Bartleby mantra. And that's from Melville's famous work, Bartle Bartleby the Scrivener where uh, his response uh, to uh, people asking him to do things was, I'd rather not. I'd prefer not to. <laughs> you must practice this every day in your mind <laughs> and in your actions. Blake, would you like to move this pair from here to there? I'd prefer not to. Blake, would you like to answer this 100-page RFP? I'd prefer not to. Murray, would you like to start a new business? Yeah, he doesn't want to do that. <laughs> Jay, is Jake here? Jake, do you want to run for mayor? I prefer not to. Yes, <laughs> good. Tip number two, don't fall for the whole efficiency myth. Um, there was a, a famous uh, writer in uh, China earlier in this century. Um, I would give you his name, but I'd prefer not to. Um, <laughs> But uh, he wrote about the coming clash between uh, the U.S. culture and the Chinese culture. And one of the things he talked about was engineers building tunnels. And in America, we, we measure twice and cut once. We make sure when the team comes in from this side of the mountain and the team comes in from this side of the mountain that they meet exactly in the middle and there's not an inch of incline. Whereas in China, evidently, they just start digging from this side and they start digging from this side. And nine times out of ten, they miss each other completely. They take twice as long to do the work, but then they have two tunnels. Is this bad? 
It's only bad if you have this like manic obsession with tempo or something. Um, so you don't have to be efficient. You don't have to be perfect. Um, can I do most things better than everybody else? Yes. <laughs> do I actually do these things? No. I delegate them to idiots and they get them done. It takes longer. It's not as good work, but I don't have to do it. <laughs> um, step number three. Um, you know, I think I'm just going to skip step number three uh, because uh, yeah, I just, I'd just rather not keep going. But I will, um, I will uh, leave with a, uh, a couple of points. Um, one, uh, another famous person once said that uh, it uh, is noble, uh, it is noble to get things done, um, but it is more noble to leave things undone. So take a few moments today and stare out of a train window. That's how J.K. Rowling developed the entire plot for Harry Potter. Um, Einstein developed his theory of relatively, relativitably by, uh, uh, by idling. There are many great things that come from idling, and best of luck. Thank you. <laughs>